Um, we live in a uh, beautiful area that has an infestation of geese. Um, you guys, uh, no one told me that before I moved to Des Moines. No one said, hey, Des Moines is a great place to live, only we have geese season. There's snow season and geese season. For anybody watching online and don't know what I mean, we have uh, an infestation of geese that dominate and control even traffic. Um, the geese will walk across um, a four-lane highway. Everyone stops and waits. I'm sure as soon as little geese babies are born, little geese lits or whatever they are, their parents tell them, you run this place, you stand still, the world revolves around you. We are at the top of the food chain. Geese, as we've talked about before, scare me from time to time. Uh, I'm not you know, embarrassed to tell you that even though I know they don't have um, claws, they don't have teeth, uh, they're not particularly uh, dangerous. They're just scary. And I, I walk, I try to walk every day. And um, I have the dogs with me sometimes, and the dogs are pretty good. They run the geese off. But uh, I didn't have my dogs with me yesterday because it was too hot. And can you imagine? I have a poodle. I said she's entitled and judgmental, but she also is cold natured, apparently. And, and she won't walk or hot nature, whatever it is. If it's too hot, she walks outside and says, too hot today, goes back in under the bed, lays down. So I'm out walking by myself uh, yesterday, and I knew I was going to have a geese problem. Now, let me rewind for about three or four days. We were having dinner with a couple from church, one of our deacons and his wife, Mark and Stephanie Caples, and they live in the same neighborhood we do. And I was just talking about my geese problem. And I'm like, I'm so sick of these geese bullying me. When I walk and make the turn and kind of come down next to this pond, these geese are all there with their babies. They get all aggravated. They start coming at you. And I said, I'm sick of it. I said, I'm gonna start carrying my golf club when I, when I go walking and I'm not gonna hit them with the business end. I'm just gonna smack them with the handle a little bit just to get you know their attention. And she said, listen, I'm tired of them too. And she said, I have this great idea. It doesn't make sense, but just try it. It'll work. And I said, well, what do you do? And she goes, when you walk and you round the corner and all the geese, they, they you know, bow up on you like geese do, um, you clap at them as loud as you can. And if you clap at them as loud as you can, they'll run from you. And I said, Stephanie, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. We're friends, I can say those kinds of things. And she said, hey, you know, just try it, it worked for me. So yesterday I'm rounding the corner, it's hot, I'm ready to get home. A geese mama and a geese dad are right there on the trail, on the concrete, like on the walking path. They're waiting for me. I don't have any dogs. And as I turn the corner and start walking, they do their goose thing. <laughs> You know, and they start hiss, I mean, they hiss at you and they don't have weapons. There's no claws, there's no teeth, but yet they sort of freak you out. And they started coming at me and the little geese babies were in the back laughing. And so I didn't know what to do. And so I remembered what Stephanie told me and I started clapping like a maniac. I'm like, ah, 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 ah. I don't know why I was going, ah, that just was my addition to the, to the process. And the geese turned around and, and ran away. And um, you should try it. If it doesn't work for you, you need to text Stephanie. I'll give you her number. But I texted Stephanie and I had to apologize. And I'm like, look, Steph, I'm really sorry. Uh, I called your idea stupid. That was genius. I said, the geese took off and fled in terror. And now I'm armed with a new way to walk. Now, you're going to be armed today with a new way to walk. You have to choose whether or not you're going to employ it. Because for some of you, it may sound stupid and you're not going to want to do it. But if you do it, it'll change your life. We're continuing our series on the parables. We're talking today about a parable that you probably have heard many times, whether you're a Christian, not a Christian, you've grown up in church, not grown up in church. It's the parable of the good Samaritan. And I just want to tell you right off the bat that many people have misunderstood the parable. It's not a parable about social justice. It's not a parable about liberation. It's not a parable about just doing good things for people who happen to need it. People have taken and abused and misused the application of this parable for years and years and years. All those things are good things, but that's not what Jesus meant when he told this story. It was a revolutionary parable. It was changing the way people lived. It gave people a new tool, a new way to walk. And Jesus said, you have to choose whether you're going to walk this way or not. And I'll just be perfectly honest with you because that's our custom. We are friends, we love each other, so we tell each other the truth. This has stepped on my toes this week. My shoes have been scuffed by the Holy Spirit this week because the word of God has stepped on my toes. I think it'll step on your toes as well, if you let it. There are three types of sermons, at least. One is a sermon somebody gives that's just for information purposes. I want you to learn something and go, huh, that is interesting. 
I'm smarter now. I walk away. That's a type of sermon. Number two is an application-oriented sermon where you hear a message, a teaching, and I say, these are three things or five things or 10 things or 12 things, if you're paying attention, that I want you to do. And then there are types of sermons that are introspective sermons where I present you with truth, encourage you to examine yourself and allow you to do whatever business God may want to do in you, in you. And these are the hardest types of sermons to um, walk away from change because they're the easiest types of sermons for you guys to turn off and dismiss, to decide it's not for me, to deflect it, to um, think of all the people you know who should hear it, to look down the row or next to you and hope your husband or wife or son or daughter is listening, but not to internalize, not to take it to heart. One day, Jesus was teaching the truths of the kingdom of God, as he always did. He was standing, people were seated because that was the custom. And a man, a lawyer stood up and asked Jesus a question. And the lawyer stood up and walked to the front of the class, stood there face to face with Jesus and said, hey, I have a question. Now, he didn't say it quite like that, but it was a confrontation it was an expert of religious law, a religious lawyer, a person who took the Old Testament law and compiled it and systematized it and parsed it and made big deals out of nothing and figured out ammunition and ways for the Pharisees to be able to control people and keep everybody in a little box. And they said that their job was to protect and preserve religion. And they thought they were protecting and preserving religion, but they squeezed it so hard and protected and preserved so well that they perverted it and turned it into something that God had never intended. And so all they were is talking about who should and shouldn't enter the kingdom, who was good enough and who wasn't good enough. And this lawyer stood up to Jesus and he asked him a really important question. Now he didn't ask him because he wanted to know, he asked him because he wanted everyone else to know how much he knew. Any teachers in here who have any students who ever <laughs> ask questions like that? Um, they really just wanna show off how much they know. And so they ask a question. And he asked a good question that maybe some other people were wondering. And he says, hey, Jesus, what do I have to do to make it into heaven? What's a person have to do to where when we die and leave this earth behind, we go see the big guy upstairs and he checks the box and says, hey, good job. You, you can enter. You were good and you were faithful. I want to read it to you. We're going to dive right in. The parable comes a little bit later. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus and said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? So Jesus answered a question with a question. Here's some wisdom. And I am not, as you know, many of you know me well, I'm not always wise. But a wise person, when they have a conversation with somebody, asks questions and listens. And when you ask questions from people, a good counselor will do this, and have people answer the questions. When a person arrives at a conclusion, they're much more likely to follow through if it's their idea than if you just tell them what to do. That's why when I teach, I want to encourage, to suggest, to invite you to change. But I don't wanna tell you you have to because that's between you and God. Jesus asks a question and he says, how do you read the law? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. You guys heard that before? Anybody heard that before? And then there's another part. You guys don't like raising your hands, do you? Let's just do this. It's summer and you may be sweating like me. This is my second service. It's okay. Uh, no one will see it but me. Have you ever heard anyone say the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What's the second part? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, I mean, every good Jewish boy could recite it. It's the Ten Commandments. The first five of the Ten Commandments the first five were about loving God. The second five were about loving your neighbor. And um, this lawyer boy, he knew it, what it was. And so he said, Jesus, how do I get into heaven? Jesus says, what do you think? And he said, the Old Testament law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus, listen to this. Knew the guy's heart, knew that he was arrogant, knew that he wasn't that interested, knew that he certainly didn't love God perfectly nor his neighbor. He says, you've answered correctly with your mouth. And Jesus said, do this and you will live. And then he drops the mic and just walks off. And his disciples are like, Jesus, you gotta quit doing this. You're leaving us hanging all the time. 
You say these things in front of people and then you just walk off and everybody wonders what you're talking about. And it's like the disciples are left there and Peter, probably the spokesperson, has to step up and go, well, thank you guys for coming. I hope you find your cars and have a safe trip home. I mean, what do you do? Jesus has left the building. He's gone. And Jesus would do that. And then he would go and he would explain what he meant later because he was preaching in parables by this time. But the lawyer wouldn't let Jesus leave. So Jesus is leaving, off, there he goes, and the lawyer's like, hey, wait, one more question, follow-up question. Because he wanted to justify who? Himself. He wanted to justify his prejudice. He wanted to justify his hatred. He wanted to justify his bigotry. He wanted to justify himself as the protector and the preserver of religion and all that's holy. So he ask a follow-up question. He says, who's my neighbor? And so then Jesus, I think, and I don't know this because it doesn't say, I think Jesus turns around and smiles, a big Jesus smile, and says, I am so glad you asked me because neighbor was clearly defined in the Old Testament. Now, I want to take you on a little trip very quickly. Pay attention quickly. This will be quick. Important for your biblical worldview. In Deuteronomy, you hear, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Leviticus, and by the way, the worst class I ever had in seminary ever was an Old Testament intensive class on Leviticus. All scripture is God-breathed, it's inspired, it's infallible, it's the sole authority for our faith and practice, but Leviticus is a tough book. Do not do devotional Bibles. Well, you can, it's just a little bit of work. It talks about requirements for a Levitical priest. It talks about all of the rules and regulations of living according to the Jewish faith, which is tremendous for us to understand how life was back then. But Jesus came to fulfill these laws and not to hold us under them like they were back in the day. And then Leviticus, um, Leviticus says that your neighbor is another Jew, part of your ethnic group, who's practicing, who's devout, who's following, somebody who you would call a brother. That you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself but your neighbor are the people who are exactly like you. And it was easy to do. But the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they wouldn't even leave it at that. They took another passage of scripture, and if memory serves, and it often doesn't, Psalm 132, 21 and 22, I think, was the passage that they used to even reduced the subset of people who they called their neighbor because in the Psalms it says, I hate the ones you hate, God. I will fight against the ones who fight against you, God. And so they got to decide who they thought wasn't right with God and who they thought was fighting against God. And do you know what, how it turned out? Was it anybody who didn't agree with them was fighting against God? Anne Lamont, an author who wrote a book called Traveling Mercies said, you know that you have successfully created God in your own image when you realize that he hates all of the same people you do. And we laugh at it, but in reality, it's what they did. And they had created such a little subset of people. And they're like, we're the righteous, we're the religious, we're the protectors of the faith. And instead of being Christ-like, they were constricting the gospel and strangling people, robbing them of hope and of peace and of freedom. And Jesus, he knew the question this guy was asking. What he was asking is a question you may have asked from time to time in your life. And if you've asked it, it's okay. It's a fair question. It's just not a mature question. It's one of those questions we wanna ask at a certain point in life, but we wanna grow. And the question is this, how close can I come to sinning without actually sinning, God? Um, the lawyer was saying, well, how many of my Jewish brothers do I have to live? How much Jewish loving do I have to do to be right with God? How close can I get to really stepping in it, but not really step in it? Because I don't want to really step in it and make God mad, but I've got to live according to my hatred, my pride, my prejudice, my bigotry as a protector and preserver of the faith. And you know, when people ask those questions, Jesus never answered those questions. He pointed them to scripture. When a child asks that question, you answer it. 
how close can I come to sinning without sinning? Because kids got to know, right? You don't tell a little child, go and make your own decisions, hope things go well, because they're not that smart, right? They're just kids. But as we grow, we're supposed to understand principles. So Jesus told a story that was full of principles that taught them how to clap. And it was different and it seemed dumb. And they had to choose whether they were going to decide. Two words are very closely connected. Compassion and mercy. In scripture, very, very closely connected. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus looked at the crowds as they were coming toward him through the fields like we talked about for the last five weeks together. And he saw them as they were coming and he looked at them like they were sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless, spiritually lost and broken. All the people, the people that irritated him, the people who didn't like him, the people who didn't vote the way he did, the people who didn't dress the way he did, the people who weren't where he was from, the people who hated the things he hated. He looked at all of them and he said, they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw their spiritual need. And when he saw them as spiritual beings and not just the external circumstances of the behavior, he was moved in his gut with compassion where he felt it. And compassion is a state of mind. It's a character trait. It's a a perspective that becomes part of who you are and it's characterized with acts of mercy. And it's so hard for us because we lack compassion. Here's why. Because we keep score the way the world keeps score. And friends, if we are keeping score the way the world keeps score, it is overwhelming. We want to fight. And wanting to fight isn't necessarily that bad. But the question is, do we want to fight for or do we want to fight against? And the Pharisees and the leaders of religion of Jesus' day, they fought against everything and everyone. But Jesus always stood for principles and what was right and never compromised one time, but yet was still gracious and compassionate, filled with compassion, acting in mercy. But compassion is not something we're naturally born with. I am not naturally born with compassion. Some are born with a little bit more of a predisposition toward compassion than others. Um, Personality traits, they vary. Some are born with the ability to forgive. Some are born a little more gracious. Some, you know, are taller, some are shorter, right? It's just the way we're born. But just because we may be born differently doesn't mean that the standard is not the same. And I promise you that compassion for people who are very different than me. And this is why I can't be very specific. And this is the great part about our church. This is what I love. Because if I start being specific and giving examples, there's some people who are like, right on, that's a great example. But yet then we have others who are like, well, that's a terrible example. Because we have people from all across the spectrum of politics and worldview, where we're from and what we care about and how we vote here right here, all across the room at Capital City Church. And everybody thinks that we're the only ones and that everybody else is like us. And what Jesus has said is the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that we all meet at the foot of the cross and that the Holy Spirit makes the adjustments in us and brings us toward the center. And we have to decide, are we fighting for that? Because if we're fighting against people, we never meet at the center because the center becomes a battleground. And the Pharisees and leaders of religious law, they had become experts in religious combat. And so Jesus said to them in this parable, I'm gonna teach you how to clap and it's gonna be uncomfortable. And if you choose to clap, You're going to live in a different way. So we need to pray for compassion because if you're like me, we are compassion deficient. And if we could take a little vitamin that has compassion and iron and vitamin B and D and all that stuff, it would be awesome. But we can't. The Holy Spirit creates it in us that causes us to view the world in a way where we see people like us and different than us as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, willing to fight for them and bring them to the center where is Jesus. Um, We... uh, 
Joy, my wife, she likes to pay attention to relationships. And um, I don't pay attention to relationships as much as she does. She's a girl and um, a lady. And as a lady, I think she connects to things in certain ways that are more advanced and beautiful than I do. When we watch golf tournaments, um, I watch the golfers. She doesn't really enjoy watching golf. She does it with me, but she connects to the story. Um, she pays attention to the wives, to the kids. And uh, just yesterday, we were watching a tournament, and John Rahm was on the tournament. And um, Choi said, oh, that's the guy who married his wife and met her in college. And they have the little boy named, I mean, she had all the details. And I'm like, no, he's the number one golfer in the world. I have no idea who his family is. But Joy always pays attention to family. Now, put that in the back of your mind, onto the geese. We're walking, we're rounding the corner to the danger zone, Joy and I, different day, um, several days ago, walking around the corner, the geese are there with all their geese families. Now, some geese families are big, some geese families are small. I don't notice the relationships, I notice the danger. We round the corner, I put her behind me, Joy, stay behind me, I'll protect you, I'll die before you, you run if it all jumps off, all that kind of stuff. And we were walking around the corner, she said, oh, there's the mama and daddy that only have the one goose baby. And I said, well, less goose danger, right, for me. And she said, no, most of them have five or six or seven. And, and I said, well, maybe this one is what God intended, and it's going to be the king of all the geese or the president, and they just need all the attention from, from the parents. And Joy said, no, 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 geese. They like quantity over quality. Um, something happened to their family, and all of the babies are gone except one. And she was moved with compassion. And I said, Joy, do you stay up at night thinking about this? Do you worry? And she goes, no, I never think about it until I see them. And then when I see them, I feel sorry for them. Now, that's a great characteristic, something I never clued in on, but a characteristic that maybe you and I find halfway to compassion. We see things, and when we see things, we feel something, but it doesn't move us to do anything. We acknowledge that there's an issue, that it's sad, something maybe we should get involved in. Something tragic may have happened, harassed and helpless, but certainly nothing that I should be proactive about or in. The disciples struggled with this. When they saw things, even knew they were supposed to be concerned, they oftentimes weren't. In this story, the parable, Jesus talks about several characters. One, he talks about a priest. A priest is from the tribe of Aaron, and they were in charge of the religious pageantry and ceremony in Jewish life. A Levite is talked about in this story. A Levite's from the tribe of Jacob, and they worked for the priests. They were sort of the assistant priests. A Samaritan is talked about. Some man who, uh, unfortunately, was beaten within an inch of his life is talked about. Jerusalem is talked about, and Jericho is talked about. Jerusalem is 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level and a treacherous road 17 miles down this road was talked about in this parable. But Samaritans were the, the hero of the story and Jews hated Samaritans. Think about the group of people, the person, the thing you hate more than anything else. Now, you may not say hate, dislike, despise, makes you the most stressed out, upset, uncomfortable. Multiply it by 10, and you have the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. It was serialized, um, passed down, heredit uh, hereditary um, racism, where if you saw somebody from this other group of people, you would kill on sight. They hated them from a political standpoint, from a religious standpoint, from a social standpoint, from a financial standpoint. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. So much so that in Luke chapter 9, Jesus, um, a story is recounted about the disciples. And Jesus is getting kind of, kind of toward the end of his days, getting ready to go to heaven. And they go into Samaria because that's where Jesus always went. Or he went to places where Christians oftentimes wouldn't see themselves going. And the Samaritans heard they were going to Jerusalem. And they said, you can't stay here in our town. Tell Jesus he's not welcome. So the disciples got excited and they came back to Jesus and they said, hey, now can we send down fire and brimstone from heaven and finally wipe out these scumbags? Because after all, we know that they deserve punishment and death. And Jesus rebuked them and said, your hatred for the Samaritans is something that we've got to talk about. And in fact, Jesus talked about it here in this parable. And we're not going to cover the whole parable today. We're gonna come back next week and we're gonna talk about the rest of it, but I wanna introduce it to you. It's a new way to clap. It's a new idea. Something we have to choose whether or not we're going to employ or not. 
something familiar to you, but maybe different in the way you've heard it taught or at least how it lands. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down the 17 mile road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. Now, back in the day, clothes were very valuable. So if you got robbed, you got stripped. It was an unfortunate um, uh, side effect of being robbed. And there he was laying in his underwear. They beat him within an inch of his life, the language says, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. Now, a priest should have been somebody who wanted to intervene. The crowd listening to this story would have thought, oh, good news, a priest is coming, and so something is good's going to happen. Now, it's just a story. It's a parable. It didn't really happen. Jesus really told it, but it's just a story that Jesus told to illustrate a point. So there's no real priest. It's just really in Jesus' story. And so the priest is coming down. And the priest, instead of getting involved, when, when the Bible says passed by, the word anti here is used, and it literally means that he backed up his far as he could to the side of the road to the rock cliff and scooted down so that he didn't get anywhere near this person this Jewish man who had been beaten and was laying there almost dead and he went on about his way so the crowd you guys would have murmured going that doesn't sound very priestly to me Maybe the priest was um, getting ready to go to the temple and didn't want to be ceremonially unclean. You know, maybe he um, was really busy and had something going on. I mean, all these things they would have thought. Now, the priest didn't really exist because it's a story Jesus made up. But yet, you know, they would have been wondering what happened. Now, and so we see Jesus continues. So to a Levite, an assistant priest, when he came to this place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan and as Jesus said, Samaritan, the crowd would have grumbled. I don't know if you guys are alert and awake enough to grumble, but can you give me a grumble? Can you like, rah, rah, rah. yeah, a Samaritan or, or boo, right? They'd have been like, it's probably the Samaritans who beat this guy up in the first place. They would have expected that. Some Jewish man laying on the side of the road had to be a Samaritan. And before you judge too quickly, oftentimes when you see crimes committed, you have make assumptions as to who you think may have committed them as well. A Samaritan came down. And as he traveled, he came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he did something. He took pity. It's this compound idea of compassion and mercy on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which would have been common for anyone to travel with. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. That's the end of the story. So the crowd listening, the lawyer standing, Jesus talking, the crowd would have been waiting for what's next. Jesus had their attention. A Samaritan, the hero of the story, this is highly unusual. So then Jesus moves on a little bit more, thankfully, this time. And, and he looks at the lawyer and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? A new way to clap, fellas. A new way to clap, ladies. A neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. So the expert in religious law said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now, you miss a little bit in the English here, so I want to help you understand it real quickly. Uh, in Greek, you have tense mood and voice that explain things that uh, help you understand a little bit more power behind the words. And as Jesus is talking, Jesus is talking, and he kind of sandwiches the lawyer's conversation with a present tense. When the lawyer answered and he said, the one who had mercy on him, it was the aorist tense, which literally just meant that it was an action that happened and was over. If I walk up to you, you need some money, I hand you five bucks and I take off and don't think about it again. That's what the lawyer was talking about. Not a new way to live, an act of charity, something to appease the conscience. Perhaps an act of obedience to God, not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was speaking from the present tense and what he said is, your old paradigm that you thought you were protecting and preserving, I have come to blow up in the best possible way. And let me tell you a secret, everyone's invited to the party. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. If you turn it into a battlefield, you're with them, not with me. And he opened his arms and he said, who's with me? 
It's present tense where he says, go and do likewise. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. Do it the next day. Become a person who just does it naturally because we are overflowing with compassion. And it's demonstrated through love. How do we live as people with conviction in a world full of conflict, but yet be filled with compassion seeing the world around us as harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Choosing to fight, but choosing to fight for them, not against them. So that the very idea of them no longer exists, but us and a meeting right here at the foot of the cross that only happens through Jesus. And friends, when Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I am the life, nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's hard enough without us making it harder. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, they just made it harder. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. You're my neighbor, they're my neighbor, them too. Oh yeah, and them. And leaves the lawyer in the crowd with the lingering implied question, are you a person of Christ-like compassion, motivated to acts of mercy and driven by love? Well, you ask me that question, you go, Pastor Rick, are you? And I'd be like, it depends on what I'm watching and how I'm keeping score. Because when I watch the news and listen to my friends and check my social media, I am not. But when I back up a step and look at Jesus, my heart begins to soften a little bit. And then I'm left with that same choice. Same choice Stephanie gave me. You know, when the geese come to attack, You even stand there like an idiot and swing your arms and kick your legs and make a fool of yourself. People have been doing that for centuries. Or you can clap and see what happens. So just like the choice I was faced with when I rounded the corner and got attacked by Mr. and Mrs. Goose, when I tried it a different way, I realized that it worked. And this afternoon, if they're still there, on that path, I'm going to do it the exact same way. So how are you going to live? I want to pray for you because I know no other way than for the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts and to install in us this perspective. And I know no other way that the world is going to see Jesus because friends, unfortunately, they're looking at you and looking at me. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent this morning, for this great story, for this great occasion in Jesus' life, and for the powerful teaching through simple parables, redefining, completing Old Testament law, blowing the minds of the protectors and preservers of the faith. Just occurs to me that Jesus never really attacked or got mad at anyone except those religious people who had designated themselves these protectors and preservers, calling them even directly perverters of the faith, having created such a small box, a tiny subset of people who they even felt were worth having peace with you. The church in our world looks a lot like that sometimes, Father. And we want no part of it. So you're going to have to motivate us, break our hearts, move us with compassion, make us people who are compassionate and willing not just to feel it, but to step out and do something just like this Samaritan did. That's driven by mercy. I thank you for these things. We love you and I love my friends. We are trying, Father. We need your help in applying this because for many of us, it's the furthest thing from what we feel and what we want. 
In Jesus' name, amen.